factors into the room, yeah. especially in this fight. Yeah. And so let's lift our voices and invite them into the room. Ain't gonna let nobody turn me around. No. politics turn me around no turn me around no 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 ain't gonna let racist politics turn me around we're gonna keep on we're gonna and we'll yeah ain't gonna let racism turn me around no Good morning. Good morning. Now I'm going to do my best to stay on my talking points. Yeah. But I have a hard time sometimes going mm. off script, especially when I'm speaking from the heart. Mm. So my name is Sean Wimberly Jr. Yes, sir. I am from Louisville, Kentucky. Yeah. I am a senior agricultural business major, uh, minor in philosophy, and I'm track, on track to, to go to law school. That's right. And I serve as the former student trustee for the board of trustees at Tennessee State University. Mm. And with us, we have Bishop Barber, the national co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign. Mrs. L L Latasha Brown, the co-founder of the Black Voters Mat Matter. Reverend Dr. Frederick Douglas Haynes III, who's a part of the Rainbow Push Coalition. And Ms. Tamika Mallory, the co-founder of Until Freedom. Yeah. Okay. So I've said enough at the Capitol. I think several of you all have seen me speak at the, um, the House subcommittees. Um, and the Senate subcommittees. Um, and it's seeming that my voice as the student representative on the board has not been fully valued. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As I said before, I serve as the former student trustee, and we know what has happened to the board of trustees um, at Tennessee State University. And I want to first say that I appreciate the fact that we do have TSU alumni on our new board for the board of trustees. But I want to make sure that when I'm talking, that we understand that although our board has been given these, these alumni, what has happened at TSU, what has happened in these past two years is a reflection of our community. Yes. Teach on. Teach on. It shows the state of our current black community. Yes, yes. And the yes. state that our university is right now is yes. simply a product of us not thinking as, strategic, as str strategically, Amen. moving as quickly, yes. or being as unified as our ancestors have been Absolutely. in the past. Yes. We've allowed others to determine our path, yes. and we've almost forgotten that HBCUs are our home yes. here in yes. America. Yes. Now, the fight to prevent the state overreach for the board of trustees has been lost. Mm. 
But I'm hopeful for the future of our university with new leadership in place. And then there's one issue that I have not mentioned about, and that is the underfunding crisis that we've seen across the nation for our HBCUs. That's it. So we got to understand we have a bigger battle ahead of us. That is the fight for equi equi equitable or equitable, fu equitable funding. Excuse my, excuse my French. But we must learn from our mistakes here, and we've done enough begging, in my opinion. Ah. And I, I'm going to say this right now. Now is not the time for begging. Now is not the time to be requesting. Yes. It is our time to take what is ours. Yes. And I want you all to understand that. 2.1 billion here, 2.2 billion there, yes. 1.5 yeah. billion, whatever. Yeah. What, what, that, that We cannot beg anymore. That's right. They haven't given it to us in the past. Yes. So what makes you all think they will give it to us now? So I want to make sure that I, I've done my speaking at the Capitol, but I speak to the black community when I say this. That's right. We can't beg anymore. We can't beg anymore. And we, I want you all to look at the state of where our university ha, ha, is at right now. That's right. And understand this is a reflection of our community. I want, I want, I want to reiterate that. Yes. So moving forward, I challenge students to remove the distractions mm -hmm. of this integrated world that we found ourselves in. Yes. Yes. I want you all to take time to learn about what it means to be black in this country mm -hmm. and the significance of our HBCUs. Yes, sir. And to never allow anybody to determine what happens to our school without us putting up a fight. That's Ooh. right. That's right. I challenge alumni to connect with us and guide us so that we may learn from our mistakes, from your all's mistakes, and build for a better future. I challenge community leaders and organizations to use your platforms and resources yes. to highlight the importance of this issue. And I challenge administrative leaders to remember who it is that they serve and the decision or the lack of decisions yes. will have a compounding impact on our community. Mm -hmm. And to the world, these HBCUs are our heart of our community. Yes. And we must protect them, we must build them, we must support them by any means necessary. Yes. So I'm going to leave my, my talking points there because I can get real deep into this, but I want you all to understand and hear me where I'm coming from. It is time for us time, to unify the students, yes. Yes. the alumni, yes. the community. Yes. We can't beg anymore. We can't sit on our toes. We can't let things just happen. Yes. Yes, sir. Yes. And so again, I sit, I sit here as the former student trustee. I understand the word former. Yes. But I want you all to know that I have hope for the future for this institution. Yeah. Yeah. I have hope for our future board of trustees, and I hope for our people and for our HBCUs across the country. Yes. I rest my case. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It disheartens me as I, I listen to my, my brother's sentiments mm. um, re regarding our, our love for this university. Mm and regarding the, the lack of a voice that we've had so far. I, I'll, I'll proceed um, by, by introducing myself. I'm Darrell Taylor. I'm, I'm currently a senior business administration major focusing in management. I'm from Memphis, Tennessee, and I currently serve as the 83rd Student Government Association President uh -huh. at Tennessee State University. Here's the, here's the thing. My position begins with student, right? Um, and and I, I'm on the Department of Student Activities. We're in Student Affairs. You, you, you get where I'm hitting at? Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, I, I think it's, it's integral to understand that a university operates from its students. And how can decisions be made regarding a university without the students? You put students in, in the focus of a department or you give students a position or give them an ability to, to have a platform and then you still take away their voice. I, I think it's very, it's very interesting, you know, that the, the timeline of the situations regarding our university has, has been so consistent with each other. Um, the, the second we bring up dollars that we're owed is the second, you know, that things of our university are brought up. And I think that's interesting because how can we simply ignore what's on paper? How can we simply ignore what the history says? And how can we simply ignore what the facts are? I think, I think it's important to understand why students choose HBCUs. I know a lot of individuals who question that, um, who might not have our best interests at heart. Well, I'll answer it for you. Students choose HBCUs because this is the network of individuals where we are actually invested into. This is where we're given that opportunity. We're given that second chance. We're not blindsided and we're not thrown to the curb by the different disparities and systematic oppressions that we face on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. I think it's a way to allow us to overcome the challenges that we face within our communities, to become that change, to become that, that uplifter, to become a part of the new strategy, 
to become a part of the new expectations. I think it's about time that we understand what it means for a student to actually attend an historically black college or university. It's pouring into the foundation that have been left for African Americans to perceive education. This is what matters most, correct? Yeah, as we know that education is one of the most valuable keys in this country as far as success. So there's no doubt that the most valuable key to success is it's being taken or it's being underfunded or it's being negligent. It's very, it's very interesting to me that considering the disparities that HBCUs are facing. This isn't just Tennessee State University. Mm -hmm. Several, right. if not all, HBCUs are facing similar issues, and it is not a coincidence. Yeah. I'll repeat that, it is not a coincidence. Nah. It must be understood that students choose HBCUs understanding the disparities that we are facing. Yeah. I chose an HBCU knowing that I may not have the best housing facilities, or I may not have the best resources or advantages as it relates to financial aid. But I also chose an HBCU because it didn't matter because I knew the community that I would have. I knew the lifelong relationships that I would develop. I knew the materials that would be invested and poured into me. I knew that the sky would be the limit when attending a university that was made for me to prosper and that was made for me to perceive. But I wish that HBCUs were viewed the same outside of the That's HBCU. Right. That's right. It's pretty interesting to me when, when we sit in the rooms with our state legislatures who make decisions about our university and have no regard and have no empathy mm. towards what we could be facing on campus. Mm. You make decisions saying our university could be great or it could be number one when it is great and when it is number one. But they don't know that, why? Because they may not have stepped foot on our campus one day. That's right. That's and they right. would not. I think it's important to understand that despite the sacrifices that we make to attend HBCUs, we want to see them be great. My goal of attending an HBCU is to graduate and be a successful steward of this economy so that I will be able to give back to my HBCU and continue to encourage black young men and black young women to pursue higher education without limitations, without restrictions. It's, it's, it's interesting to me when I take a look back at history um, and, and as, a, as a youth, I would say, getting a little bit more comfortable with what the real world looks like. It's pretty baffling to see some of the things that are still in line with what happened 40 and 50 and That's 60 right. years That's ago. Right. Yeah. It's pretty interesting. We, 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 we made our arrival in, our, in this country as African Americans without yeah. the right to, the ability to read or write altogether. We gained that ability still with, with, with segregation mm -hmm. or still with the ability not to have the same resources as our counterparts. Then when we move forward, now everything's free. We can't attend the colleges that we want to attend. Mm -hmm. We cannot have the financial aid that we desire. Mm -hmm. Then there's responses to that. And now affirmative action is put into place. Now HBCUs are continuously being severely underfunded. I am not understanding when things will finally change. I'm not understanding how many generations that it'll take to beg or generations that it'll take to plead or take to advocate for us to finally get what we deserve as equal citizens as this country. Yeah. It's pretty interesting to me because once upon a time we were identified as three-fifths of a human being. Mm -hmm. Well, if you're only investing to, in us a quarter of the way, then maybe you still see us as three-fifths of a human being. That's right. That's right. It does not make sense to us as students why we don't deserve the same quality of a college education because we decided to go somewhere that we feel that will pour into us and that will invest into us. That's right. I should not be able to look at other state institutions that are governed with the same dollars that we are and their campuses look 10 times better than ours. Yeah. Teacher, teacher, teacher. How does that feel to a, a young black man and a young black woman that is looking for their, their, their college choice? They, they go to a, a HBCU and it's, it's not the most appealing and they, they head to the predominantly white neighboring institution and is everything that they can imagine, the, the promised land for, for education. I don't think that That's that right. should be ignored and we should continue to ignore that. That's it. That's I, it. I, I'm tired of the distractions. I'm tired of these conversations. I, I began my term on this conversation and I'm ending my term in the same conversation. I am exhausted of saying keep the same fighting. thing. Yeah. Yeah. We're, 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 we're tired of saying the same things, but we're going to continue to overcome because we, we, we've, we've made it here. And one of my favorite quotes, if, if not us, then who? And if, now, if not now, then when? That's it. And I think it's important to understand that the time is now, and it will be every second of every day until That's we it. get what we understand. That's it. That's it's it. rightfully ours. That's yeah. it. That's so yeah. I, I'll leave you with this. My goal as, as Student Government Association hasn't been to, to change the world. It's, it's only been to 
to make the student experience on my campus better day by day. And, and what I find amongst the confusion and the anxiety of the students is that we just want to be heard. We just want to have a seat at the table. Yeah. We do not want to continue to hear that we support the students and we want to see what's best for the students and then continue to not see ourselves being supported or continue not to see what's best for us being important into us. We don't want this to be just a story. We don't want this to be just in a news page. We don't want this to be just a headline or an opportunity to say this is our next big thing. We want this to be an opportunity for students to finally be heard, for students to finally be recognized, for funds to finally be given, and for our universities to be treated equally, despite the excuses, despite the pointing fingers, despite the myths, the stories, we're, we're, we're tired of it. As students, we are ready to be heard, and when you are ready to hear us, we'll begin the conversation. That's right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. These powerful students have opened up for us what the real issues are. And we were received an invitation uh, to come and be with them on today. I think you heard them say, irregardless of what the legislature has done the other day, the fight still continues. Yes. The fight still continues. Yes. I am Reverend uh, Bishop William Barber with Repairers of the Breach. And we have here today Roland Martin, we have Dr. Freddie Haynes, we have Latasha, uh, where's Latasha Brown, and Tamika, did Tamika make it? Tamika here today. But I want to settle us in a couple of places before we move. Number one, we're here today to say to all alumni and students, it's time that we sound an alarm yes. and fight back in every state. Yes. In every state. Number two, in every state, because all of the colleges that are underfunded, except for the Black University in Oklahoma, are in the former Confederate states. That's right. All of them that are underfunded. $12 billion, 13, almost $13 billion of underfunding. Mm. And every one of those states should have black and white and brown people bringing lawsuits to guarantee yeah. that those schools That's are funded right. properly. Right. All of them should be. Wow. We're here today to say that everybody that's concerned about this issue, and especially students, need to, need to be registered to vote and use those right. votes to determine yes. who sits in yes. these legislatures. Yes. And where they stand on HBCU should be a major factor yes. in whether or not we, they get our votes. Yes. We're here to say, I was a student government president, and I remember when we fought that the students had an automatic seat it wasn't chosen by the trustee board or the governor. The students had an automatic seat. In fact, when I was there, the student government president was automatically a member of the board of trustees. Right. The students ought to have an automatic seat that they pick, not that's picked for them. And there ought to be precincts, voting precincts on every campus because students can vote where they go to school. That's what the law said. And then lastly, I think time, Roland, Latasha, and others, that we bring back something we did in the 70s, and that was we used to have Black College Day, where every year all black colleges simultaneously marched on their state legislature and demanded funding and met with their legislature. It's time to renew that again and call for that kind of activism. Now, let's be clear real quickly. We are here because of a guy named Justin Moriel. 1862, he passed the Land Grant Agriculture and Mechanical College right, Act. 1862, Freddie. But it did not guarantee African Americans could attend. It took 28 years after the Civil War for a second Moriel Act. And that act said, Either you had to allow African Americans equity in going to land grant schools that the federal government gave the land, or you could create. And out of that, there are 19 historically black land grant institutions. So the whole reason we're here yeah. is because of denial. That's right. That's right. The whole reason we're here is because of funding. And here's the truth. This underfunding didn't just start two years ago. Right. Yeah. The truth is that 
other than the initial land grants, black schools went without government land grant funding until 1970. That's right. Yes. When Congress, not the state legislature, when Congress finally passed legislation to give them an annual appropriation. So the predominantly white schools that were land grant, they got their money from 1862 on. Right. But right. HBCUs that were land grant didn't even begin to get any kind of equity and appropriation until, the eight, until 1970. Yeah. That's the challenge that we had. And then lastly, hear this. According to various laws enacted in 18, 1887, federal land grant universities funding must be matched. This is what the law says, my lawyer friend. The law says that it must be matched from non-federal sources. That means the state. In 2020, Tennessee General Assembly provided $69.4 million in land grant dollars, $2,460 per student to the University of Tennessee, where 77% of the students are white. More than four times the match. Hear what I just said. The law said you have to match it. They went four times above the match. But TSU and its 6,000 students got just $8.7 million, $1,318 per student from the same state in 2020. Only 12% above the match. It wasn't until 2017 that the Tennessee State Legislature began meeting its matching requirement at all for Tennessee State, and they've never met the match. And when the federal government sent a letter to the schools, yes. Governor Bill Lee, who says he loves the values of Dr. King, that's what he says. He, says. he said that he wasn't sure whether he was going to accept mm. the $2.1 billion figure as fact. Wow. Come on. As fact. Mm. As fact. The governor right now is inside the Capitol at the bottom of the steps. Yeah. Oh, Call him over here and tell him, oh, come, come over here and commit to these HBCUs. Yeah. Come commit $2.1 million. Yeah. Billion yeah. $2.1 billion. And Senator Bo Watson, who, yeah. chairs the, who chaired the Ways and Means Committee, said he's not buying it. He said he's not buying it. They don't owe that money. But history is clear. And my brother just said, we can't keep begging. That's right. We have to have legislation, That's right. litigation, yes. and agitation. That's right. Will y'all say that with me? Legislation, legislation. Litigation, litigation, and agitation. And agitation. And agitation. And agitation. We need it in Kentucky. Yes. We need it in Tennessee. Yes. We need it in Mississippi. Yes. We need it in Virginia. Yes. We need it in Maryland. Yes. We need it in Arkansas. Yes. We need it in Missouri. Yes. We need it in Oklahoma. Yes. We need it in South Carolina. Yes. We need it in Alabama. Yes. We need it in Georgia, yes. West Virginia, yes. Louisiana, yes. Texas, yes. Florida, yes. North Carolina. Yes. Agitation, Agitation. Litigation. litigation, and legislation. legislation. Rolling March. Yes. Freddie, Freddie, Dr. Freddie Haynes. Dr. Latasha, where's Latasha? Freddie Latasha. Thank you. She's right behind me. Thank you so much. Let me thank, first of all, our outstanding student leaders from yes, Tennessee yes. State uh, for the invitation to come and stand in solidarity uh, with you. You are not in this fight by yourself. Amen. And so we thank you because you represent the best in leadership. And you are doing it in spite of the fact that your beloved institution is being plundered That's through right. underfunding. That's and yet right. we are still producing excellence Excellent. in leadership. Yeah. And so we salute you for your leadership and for your work. Let me also say thank you to Bishop Barber for his outstanding leadership. Uh, Bishop Barber is always on the case. And so thank you, Bishop Barber. Thank you, Roland Martin. Thank you, Latasha. Uh, all of these leaders represent the fact that we have come from around the country mm -hmm. because even though Tennessee State and the Tennessee legislature is now the face of this civil rights issue, it is a nationwide issue. 
I come from Texas. We have a land-grant institution in Texas, Prairie View A&M University. And I'm simply saying, as a proud alum of an HBCU, our HBCUs have always performed in an outsized fashion outperforming, in a real sense, the limited resources that they have been given. In a real sense, HBCUs have been guilty of doing much with little. Yeah. And as a consequence, yeah. land-grant colleges, which were founded, thank you, Bishop Barber, for that history lesson, but the rationale behind land-grant colleges was to ensure that these colleges would make a contribution to the state where they found themselves. Mm. Tennessee State University has made an invaluable contribution. Yeah. You can't think of the Tiger Bells doing what they did during the Olympics without connecting them to Tennessee State University. Tennessee State University with Wyoming Titus, not to mention Carl Rowan, not to mention Oprah Winfrey. We could call the role of the, contri the, uh, the, contr the contributions that have been made by graduates of this institution, and yet they have made it being underfunded. underfunded. Imagine what would happen if Tennessee State University was invested in in a way that was commiserate and with what you do, Tennessee, uh, the University of Tennessee. Imagine what would happen if these young men had the same resources, the Man, same right, kind right. of access to, to housing, access to scholarships yeah. that those at other institutions have. We're simply saying that this nation, oh, no. this state, yeah. is robbing itself yeah. of good resources right. when we do not treat Tennessee right. State University as we do others. And so we have come here to say with Bishop Barber and with these students that yeah. we're going to agitate, yeah. we're going to litigate, and we're going to legislate until education yeah. is equitable yeah. for all of us. Yeah. And so, Bishop Barber, yes, I simply add to what you've said, yes, we want education through agitation, yes, litigation, yes, and legislation. Yes, and we're going to have it, and we ain't going to let nobody turn us around. Yeah. I am Frederick Douglass Haynes III, President CEO of Rainbow Push Coalition, and you know the legacy of Reverend Jesse Jackson, also an alum of an HBCU, and that HBCU that produced him. Imagine what would happen if that HBCU was well-resourced, and it still produced a Reverend Jesse Jackson. And I'm simply here to say that we ain't gonna let nobody turn us around, and we're saying to Tennessee, we're saying to Texas, we're saying to every state, in the words of my mama, don't now. steal my eyeballs and then blame me because I can't see. Woo. Don't steal from yeah. our students yeah. and yes, then wonder yeah. why we're not producing yes, sir. Yes, sir. what other yeah. colleges are doing. We're doing it anyhow. Imagine what we would do if there was equity when it comes to funding yeah. our HBCUs. Yeah. Yes, and that's what we're here, that's what we're calling for. We been able to see even when you stole our eyeballs imagine what would happen if you gave us equitable funding yes, and that's what we're calling yes, for. Sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. yes sir yes sir yes sir well the first thing i did right was the day i started to fight yes, sir. keep your eyes on the prize oh, and hold no. on I just want to stand in that spirit and that spirit of our people yeah. at these land grant institutions, uh -huh. the spirit of our people to always stand and keep our eyes on the prize yeah. and to know that we can't back down yeah. and we've got to fight. Got and so in this space, one of the things I want to ask is I want to ask a question. Mm. I want to ask a question while we're here to the state legislature. Why is Tennessee State being treated differently than UT? And you yeah. ask me, what do I mean by that? Well, let yeah. me tell you what I mean by that. Why is it? that here we're hearing that part of the audit was as a result of, yes, there was housing, that the state, didn't, they accepted too many students and they needed extra housing. Well, in fact, the University of UT actually had more students that they needed and they had the money, guess what, to purchase and buy a hotel. 
Why did why did um uh, why did TSU have to go to back to the legislature? Because their money that they did not have two point yeah. bill two point one billion dollars, and they had to go back to ask them for resources for the hotel. Perhaps they could have purchased a hotel as well if they had gotten the two point one million. Right. That's and right. I question right. whether either the U UT was able to purchase a hotel because perhaps yeah. some of the money that was meant for this university yeah. actually got allocated to that university, oh, right? Other resources. So as we stand here in this space, even the audit itself, yeah. let's just break down this, this whole idea of the audit. Mm. The state paid $2 million for an audit that the discrepancy actually accounted to $4,000. This is not about a discrepancy, and there were discrepancies at other universities. Yes. This was not about this. This is an attack. attack. And so what we're seeing all across this nation, this attack on DEI, it's not just an attack on DEI as a program, it's an attack on diversity all across this nation. There's an attack on equity all across this nation, and there's an attack on inclusion all across this nation. And so we're standing here now yeah. on the backdrop of TSU, but we're saying there's $13 billion that's owed us. Owed Give us. us what we owe, what right. you owe us. Right. Right. Give us what we've worked hard for. Right. Give us what we've contributed as taxpayers yeah. in this state and all across the nation. Give us what our hard work yeah. has yeah. actually produced. We're not going to take it anymore. We're keeping our eyes on the prize. Right. We're going to be in the streets. We're going to be organizing. Yeah. When our rights are under attack, you know what we do? We, we fight organize back. and fight back. That's when right. our rights are under attack, what do we do? We, we fight back. That. When our rights are under attack, what do we do? We, we fight, fight back. back. Thank That's you. Right. Yes, we yes, ma'am. Yeah. Oh, and I didn't even introduce I'm Latasha Brown with Black Voters Matter. Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I'm Roland Martin, founder of the Black Star Network, uh, also host of Roland Martin Unfiltered. Uh, we have been covering this story for the last 15 months when other national media uh, has been silent. But I have a series of questions, and the first question really is for all of you who are reporters here in the state capitol. Mm -hmm. You should be asking every single Republican and Democrat, yes. how many of you have ever stepped foot on the campus of Tennessee State? Wow. That's right. Wow. You, you should be asking each one of them. You should literally put the role list and say, how many of you have actually been to the campus of Tennessee State? How many of you have attended a commencement at Tennessee State? How many of you have actually organized a legislative town hall on the campus of Tennessee State? But I can guarantee you, Nearly every Republican and Democrat in this legislature has been to the University of Tennessee. Yes, right. That's right. I can guarantee you they've been to many of those campuses all across this state. Yes, right. There's only one public HBCU, so it's not like there's a lot they have to actually visit. That's right. It's just one in this city right here. And the reason that's important because it is hard for folks sitting in this capital to make decisions about a place they've never seen. And they haven't talked to anybody there. But also, I want y'all to start asking the questions, all of y'all who are reporters here, okay. when did they start caring about Tennessee State? Was it when they started asking for the money? No. That's right. See, they were ignoring the school for all of these years. But until that committee said they were owed $544 million, all of a sudden, there was high interest and what was happening at Tennessee State. And then when they began to ask for just half of the money, half. then folk began to say, well, we need audit. Ask yourself, how many state schools have had five audits in one year? Yeah. Wow. That's right, that's right. That's right. If you want to understand America, you got to follow the money. That's right. right. If you ain't discussing money, you ain't having an American conversation. Right. That's, right. that's right. So whenever you start talking about the money, all of a sudden, folk attitude began to change. That's right. And that's what we are now beginning to see. You cannot show me, and I've covered city government, county government, state government, federal government. You cannot show me anywhere in America when an audit was done and no fraud was uncovered None. and the entire board of trustees was removed. Yeah. Yeah. See, I'm not, I'm not satisfied 
that the new board is constituted of all Tennessee State graduates because I have to question how they got there. Then I have to question who picked them. Then I got to question who passed the laws that created that environment. And so all of y'all should be asking different questions. Y'all should be asking them, why, why now? Why all of a sudden so much interest in Tennessee State? You also need to be asking different sets of questions. You should be asking this legislature, how can you deny a school of equal funding when they literally have hundreds and thousands who are trying to get in? Get in. That's Tennessee it. cannot compete economically with America without an educated workforce. So here you have a school doing that and they literally are trying to starve them and choke them from the resources. Yes. So you've got to be challenging them in a different way. Yes. But see, the only reason you can challenge them that way is when you, who are members of the media, actually give a damn about Tennessee State. Yes. So you've got to now be asking yes. your news directors and general managers and editors, how often are you covering what's happening yes. at Tennessee State? Yes. Do you show up to Tennessee State when there's controversy, or do you show up when there are other things that are happening right. that are for the good of the institution? You must begin to say, if we call it for equal funding, then you got to have equal coverage. And it can't just be all about orange in this state. You must also be focused on blue and white as well. We cannot have strong institutions if they are constantly under attack. That's right. And the fact of the matter is this university and HBCUs nationally are under attack. And what has happened in this state, I promise you, you're going to see happen right. in other states. Because what we have seen what Republicans do, they have one test case in one state right. and then now take it around the country. Right. When they passed stand your ground laws in Florida, it went around the country. Yes. When they passed voter suppression laws in Georgia, it went around the country. When they begin to attack black voters in North Carolina, right. it began to go all around the country. So we see the pattern that is unfolding right now here in Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And so they are going to be challenged at every uh, opportunity. And reporters here, you need to be asking, how can this legislature find $500 million to fund a football stadium for a billionaire owner, but cannot fund the full $544 million for an institution? You cannot care more about football in Tennessee than you do educating the students of Tennessee. You cannot say you're against DEI, but you don't mind DEI Saturdays at the University of Tennessee. Understand what we are seeing is an outright attack on black folks in this country. And let's be perfectly clear, we ain't going nowhere. We built it, and as Dr. King said, be true to what you put on paper and understand we will be back. They will be challenged and don't be surprised when we show up in your cities and your towns come election time. Thank you, Roland. Members of the media, three things I want you to pay attention and we'll take questions. What we're talking about is not our opinion. It is the law. The whole part of the second Moriel Act yes. was to ensure that if white institutions wouldn't accept black students, that HBCUs could be built. And in 1887, it said that money had to come. Another audit I want you to pay attention to. It wasn't the HBCUs that said they're owed $13 billion. It was the federal government that yes. did an audit. That's right. That's right. That's right. The federal government did the audit mm. and sent letters. Right. Am I right? Yep. Yes. Sent letters to all the governors and state legislatures saying you are in deficient and in violation of the funding formula that is supposed to undergird HBCUs. And you have been operating in an inequitable fashion to the tune of $13 billion recently. That's right. Because probably more than that if you look at it all the way through yeah. history. Yeah, that's right. But the tune of $13 billion recently. Pay attention to that order. The second thing we ought to pay attention to is Republicans 
extremists, I don't call them Republicans, but they love to claim they are the party, they are party of Lincoln. Well, Justin Moriel was a Republican, but he was a Lincoln Republican. Lincoln Republican. What these Republicans are doing is counter mm -hmm. what they try to claim as their history. Mm -hmm. It's counter. It's not, it's not what they should be doing. They should be investing. And then lastly, if you have a business, Freddie, Latasha, if I'm not mistaken, the one thing you want to do with a business is grow it. That's right. And, and you don't get penalized for growing a business. If you're a farmer and you plant some seed, you want to grow it. And you don't get penalized if the seed goes in as corn and comes up as a corn stalk with corn. You, you don't get penalized if you have some animals, mm. a little puppy. Mm. You want that puppy to grow. Yes. If you have a child, yes. you, want it to grow. you want that child to grow, to grow. Yes. mentally, physically. And you don't get penalized don't get for that. saying the child grew up. Yes. TSU is getting penalized for growing. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. Who ever heard of such? I'm monitoring my language. Whoever heard us <laughs> to be penalized mm. for growing right. an institution, right. for adding students, yes. for creating an academic atmosphere and a moral atmosphere yes. that is a magnet, that is attracting students. That's what this legislature that's, that's has done. Yes. They are penalizing these young men, that's right. president and all, for growing. But understand this very clearly. Come on, Tamika, I see you. Understand this. By attacking these students mm. and attacking these universities, yes. you have planted another seed, and it will grow. It will grow into litigation. It will grow into agitation. Mm -hmm. And it will grow into voter participation. Because one thing is true. Every time in history, we have been forced to fight. We do, mm -hmm. and we win. Mm -hmm. The fight is on. It has to be on, because yeah. we will yeah. not allow folk to penalize us for success. Yes. Yes. Amen. I have Tamika Mallory here. She's our last speaker. She just got in, and then we'll take our questions mm -hmm. from the media. Thank you so much, and I'm so apologetic to this group, the great group of organizers, for being late, but I just flew in, so I ran here as soon as I could. Um, first of all, I want to start by thanking Reverend Barbara and also Roland Martin for making sure that we pulled together, and no matter what was happening on our schedules, where we were in life, it was important that we be here today uh, and that we spend this day not just supporting the students of TSU and this institution that we are specifically in this state to focus on, but HBCUs across the nation right. that need the voice of all of us, all the organizers, the advocates, and every single student and administrator needs to be outside, outside of the buildings, on the ground, getting together with people in the local community to say that this is not just a college issue, it is not just a student issue, mm. it is a community issue. Yes, the issue right and the reason why we know it's a community issue, I, I, I've heard as we, I was running in, I could hear <laughs> Roland talking about the attack in general that is happening across the board against our communities the banning of books and the banning of really our stories in yeah. the educational yeah. system. The attacks against diversity, equity, and inclusion. Yes. The defunding of our programs, mm -hmm. voter suppression. Actually, the other piece is the narrative is shifting around black folks and our needs and our contribution to this nation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There is an attempt to erase us, That's it. and we must be clear that it is coordinated and it is actually very strategic if you're paying attention. 
And so we must be the same. We've done this before, brothers and sisters. We are yeah. attacked constantly. Constant. What we cannot allow is the naysayers to get in our minds and tell us that we're uneducated, we're unqualified, and that we do not deserve to reap the benefits for a nation that we built. We built this nation on our backs. And as my sister Angela Rye would say, we did it for free. For free, that's right. But we will not stand by and allow it to be for free. We didn't have a choice back then. We have one now to say you will pay us, you will respect us, and you will invest in our communities and especially in our young people. I want to make sure that I talk to young folks who are listening today and let you know from a group called Jodeci back in the days, they used to say, can I talk to you? Yes. I want you to hear loud and clear that this is your moment. That's your moment. It is your moment yes. to get organized to fight back. Get organized, get angry, but get together, get together. with one another across yes. states and ensure that you are taking an example out of the TSU students' book where That's they right. got together and Come said, on. no, you will not do what you want with our institution. Yeah. And we have to make sure that that spreads and that yeah. the message is across the nation that now is the time. We cannot be on the back end. Yeah. We must be on the front end. And yes. that's why we came here today to support you. But this fight is about you. You have the energy. You have everything you need to stand up and fight for yourselves. And my organization, Until Freedom, will be here with all of you. We will continue to fight with you. We will not leave you in this fight alone. And we will go from your camp to the State House, and we will ensure that when it comes time to vote, we will remember who was with us, who was standing That's here right. today, yeah. and who was not. God bless you all. That's right. That's exactly right. Let me invite Brother Wimberley and Darrell up and our other speakers to come up and make one more clear point. Come on in. There are over 100 HBCUs operating in 50 states. They enroll over 300,000 students, 80% of whom are black. 15% of the bachelor degrees earned by blacks come from HBCUs, 6% of the masters, 12% of the PhDs from HBCUs. But we also know, and this is part of what we're saying here today, this is about state houses. Right. And I want to say this clear. Many of these state legislators are not winning their offices because people are voting. That's right. They are winning because people are not voting. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Reverend Gordon is here with the Poor People's Campaign, and one thing that we've done is a study, and we know, now know that over 40 percent of the people in this state that vote are poor and low-wage voters. And if just 20 percent, mm. hear me now, just 20 percent yes. yes. of those who are have not voted, were to vote around issues like HBCUs and living wages and health care, you could determine who sits in the governor's yeah, office, who right. sits in the that's legislature. Right. That's right. Don't believe the hype that we don't have power. That's right. That's right. That's right. The fact of the matter is most southern states are not red states or blue states. They right. are unorganized yeah. states unorganized. where we have not organized that's our right. power. That's right. And, 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 and Tamika is right if young folk and all of us get together and organize our power and don't believe the negatives that say we don't have power. We have unused power. And let it be said that we are not going to stay home. Do not allow people to get into these state legislatures by default. Make them have to come through your votes. Make them have to come through your power. Make them have to come through your strength. That's right. No unopposed. We need you to run. We need to rail. That's what I'm serious. Yeah. Are there any questions from members of the media? Before, before oh, questions, sure. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Before, before yes, questions, sir. I want to uh, thank all, all the guests here that came. And uh, Darrell and I, we've been working hard to make what's been happening thank at you. TSU become a national issue. And we've been trying to garner support from all different organizations um, around, around this city, around the state, and around the country. So to see what we've gotten to at, at the end of our term. Yeah. You all did um, it. So I, I want to say that I, that I appreciate that. But I want to reiterate my point, because when I first got on this mic, y'all had me a little nervous. 
I'll be honest with y'all, because this issue is not only something that I find very important, I find it to where I want to make sure that what I say, you all hear me. And for those of you on, on, on the camera watching in from the calls, I want you all to understand how important what has happened here at yeah. TSU, what's happening to our other HBCUs. We cannot allow people who have not stepped foot on our campus, Take it. who don't Take understand it. our culture, That's it. to make decisions for us. Our HBCUs, and I say it again, I say it for the last time, our HBCUs are our home. TSU has allowed me to travel to Africa, to Japan, to say across it, the country, and I'm starting to understand the world as a student. And I'm seeing the importance of this HBCU. Yes. So I don't, I, I just want to make sure I put that there for everyone to hear it. Oh. All right, so I, I'll leave it at that and we'll let's, let's my, uh, my brother has something to say. Where are you going uh, to law where, school? I can't mention that on camera yet. Okay, but, uh, all right. But you all, right. you all, well, you all. Well, you know, I'm asking, we want to send you some money. Yes, sir, yes, sir. We'll, so we'll, talk, you, we'll talk, we'll talk off camera. Yes, sir. Okay, all right. <laughs> you got anything? Before we proceed with questions from the media, we would like to thank um, all of the organizers of this event, everyone who has helped and contributed to the support system that we have as we continue this initiative. So I do want to thank the Equity Alliance, the TSU NAACP right. chapter, as well as the Nashville NAACP, I'm sorry, NAACP chapter, yes. as well as our Student Government Association right. at Tennessee State University. Um, and we can proceed now with questions from the media. Thank, thank you. you all. Yes. Let them go to the questions to the students first. Any questions? Yeah. You mentioned lawsuit. Uh, who has standing to, to sue? Like I know it's happened in other states. Who does that? Who would sue? Well, that's one of the things. There are various people that have standing, and part, partly is citizens have standing. Black folk have standing. Civil rights groups have standing. Yeah. So what we're doing is going to investigate in every state who stands. There are already suits mm -hmm. going on. But what we're saying is that, and Roland can come up, there needs to be a coordinated uh, 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 form of litigation because this is not something that's just happening here or there. It's happening everywhere. Uh, so right now in Georgia, the Black Caucus in Georgia mm. filed state against the yes. state of Georgia uh, to receive uh, that the money for the land grant institutions. Fort Valley State uh, is owed $603 million. Yes. Uh, and so in Georgia, they estimate the HBCUs there, uh, the land grant, have been cheated out of in excess of $2 billion. Oh, yeah. uh, and so that's the case. You also, uh, when, they, when the lawsuit that took place against Maryland, uh, the school couldn't sue, but that was an external group that sued. That's how they got that $400 million settlement there. Alvin Chambliss sued uh, in Mississippi. Uh, so you've had uh, a number of examples all across the country in Alabama, Mississippi, Maryland, and Georgia where uh, state was school, states have been sued for the lack of funding to HBCUs. Yes. And one of, the thing, one of the things that can also happen is you see these students right here? They, I, we are, have lawyers are looking at, they have standing. Yes. They, have standing. Oh, yeah. they have standing, because they're students, yes. especially the ones that are still in school. Yes. And, and the courage that, I saw the question, and the courage that um, a state black caucus, if it has the courage, can sue its own legislature. That's right. That's right. That's right. And should. Yes. Right. right. And should. And we Okay remember, okay, remember, okay, Tennessee State, they are employees of the state. That's right. So they, they can't sue. So again, in, I'm going to use Maryland as an example. There was an external group that sued in Maryland. Coppin State, Morgan State, um, uh, of course, Mor uh, uh, of course uh, Bowie State, as well as Eastern Shore, they were not parties of the suit, but individuals who were alumni, uh, okay. as well as the Black Hawks and others, so they were participants in that. So the school cannot sue, but as Reverend Barber said, parties can sue, yes. and yes, they should. The reality is if you're waiting, first of all, black folk have been waiting since, <laughs> since the yeah. land grant schools were created in the 1800s. Uh, and so the Tennessee Black Caucus, uh, and I challenged Representative Harold Love on my show uh, last week, uh, they should be filing a right, suit. Right. If this legislature will not spend the $2 that's billion, right. dollars, they need to sue the legislature that's and right. take them to court and put them under depositions and then say, why won't you give them the funding? Because when you do that, now you can begin to examine how they fund every other public institution. That's right. Yes. yes. So I think this is a larger issue, and this is for the students, Darrell and uh, Sean. I mean, Darrell and Sean, um, can you speak more to, um, I know we said this is an issue across the world, across the state on HBC campuses, but what's your call to action so that we can get students not only from Tennessee State, this University, Philander Smith University, American what Baptist can we do, American Baptist, to put this call out? And I'm not saying everything yeah. don't need to be on camera, but how can we strategically organize to get these students 
you know, to understand this is important because mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, you all are students. Mm -hmm. It's much more than just, you know, coming up to the Capitol, but putting the urgency out there that That's this right. is important. Like, this is really important. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll go first. So I mentioned it when I first spoke about challenging students. The, the, the generation now um, is 2024. Times have changed. You can't, you can't go to students and say, hey, uh, read this, this large paragraph about what's happening because we know students aren't going to do it. So how we operate as student leaders, how we move as students who, who, who are on our campus, I think I, I said earlier, we have to challenge these students that we got to, you, you got to understand what it means to be black in America and what it means to be at the HBCU. So how, do, how we get to that point, I think it starts with the student leadership. It starts with, um, you know, how our campuses are. And, and uh, are you at ABC by chance? Or? No, I'm a graduate of Columbus. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, so, so for the students who are there on campus, why our whole experience can't just be about uh, uh, the fun and games, because we're going to miss these opportunities. We're going to allow people who have not been on our campus to make decisions for us. So, to answer that question, we've been working hard to try, try to figure that out. I think it's going to take um, some more action, working with organizations, working with alumni. I mentioned that earlier about the whole collective. Um, but as students, we have to take that initiative. And what, what him and I have done is learning these issues, trying to figure out what's going on, what's the next step, what can we do, instead of just um, scrolling on TikTok. So I mean, that's, that's, that's the hard truth. And we're not the generation of the past, but the issues we're facing are still the same in the past. So how we how we yep. how we how we strategize is is we're, we're trying to figure that all that out. Let right? me say one thing after Darrell and Darrell, you have something that I oh, want to say something. Okay. okay. History is a great teacher, mm. and Dr. Haynes and I had shared this with um, Roland, and we were going to share it at some point with others. In 1960. Students went to Shaw University in Raleigh, right. closed the doors, and had a strategic meeting. That's it. Ella Baker was there not to control the conversation, That's right. That's right. but to make sure that the students could have the conversation. And students organized SNCC. Dr. Haynes and I have been talking about, I was at Lincoln University a few weeks ago, and the students up there walked 87 miles. Mm to their state legislature. Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, in Pennsylvania. Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Two. Huh? Yeah, two. That's right, okay. <laughs> and, and there are two, that's right. You gotta make sure you get the right one. The one that Thurgood Marshall graduated from. Pennsylvania. That's right, Langston Hughes, that right? All right, <laughs> I'm messing with rope. But they walked. Now, the administration didn't want them to do it at first. Mm -hmm. and, and rightfully so, because they were concerned about them as students. Right. You know, they have, there's insurance. But they did it, and they forced that legislature. While I was there, the students there said, we sat around afterwards, talked about an hour. And I called Dr. Haynes and said, you know, we need to convene right. students from every one of these land grant colleges That's right. to a closed door strategic, not to tell them what to do, mm -hmm. but to pay, if we got a fund, because students got money, they got to pay for books and stuff. Right. We need to fund them to come together and let them strategize about what kinds of power and step. You heard me mention Black College Day. That came out of a strategy session, yes. right. right? But one thing we know is that, as both of these young men have said, this moment can't be missed. And I want to say to you, I'm older now, 61. But I was a student government president and a member of the, of the Board of Trustees of my land grant institution. I remember when we fought because they wouldn't put a precinct on our campus. Mm. So we marched 1,200 students to the precinct mm. they had yeah. there you go. and then demanded the next year we had one on the campus. I remember when they wouldn't put a student on the Board of Trustees. So we fought mm -hmm. to make it a law. That's the kind of strategy that's got to happen. And I know Dr. Haynes, I believe I can hear Latasha Mooman in the back and Tamika and Roland. We're going to work on pulling that together. That's right. But that we won't discuss all of that out here. Because yep. anybody just think they got all the answers, well, then where you been? <laughs> Nobody has all the answers. But, but if we can get these, the, think about getting all of the students represented from these 19 land grants in the room. That's right. The genius of that, yeah. the brilliance of that. That's right. And I want to commit today 
that we're going to make that move. Right. And right. then when yeah. we come out of that room, they're going to tell y'all what the strategy is and where we're going. Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah, come on, Latasha. You know, I also want to shift our narrative around young folks, that young mm -hmm. folks aren't organized. We're here because young people have been organized. That's right. sure. And sure. so sometimes what happens is that young folk are doing the grunt work and on the back, we don't see it, right? But, all, but at the end of the day, movements have always started when a committed few folks right. have seen a vision and cared when it wasn't sexy, when it wasn't cute. And at the end of the day, what we've seen is that even here, there are some organizations like I love the Sister Equity Alliance, they actually have a TSU organizer that they've actually put here that's been organizing with some of the young folks. Some of the young women like Sister Amber right here have been working for three months where they've literally been organizing folks on the ground. I'm saying this because young folks, literally, you are the way that you all are moving the world. Yeah. That, I want to share this. Right. At, that young people do care. We've been oh, seeing, yeah. we've been getting the, we have been getting, um, uh, we've been getting the phone calls, we've been supporting some of the work that's on the ground. And so it's a matter of, we're doing a larger call, not just for young folk, all of us should care about this. Sure. The alumni, if we have graduated or benefited, and that's all of us, from HBCUs, this is our call to action too, that we've got to stand behind. Even if we went to a PWI, you have benefited from the brilliance of black folk who have graduated from these HBCUs. And so this has to be a call to action to, for all that we stand behind these students who have been doing the organizing, we stand behind these students who literally are standing in the gap. Some of them haven't had the resources. They have not known what to do other than literally organize their peers. And so I just want to lift that up because we've seen that that's how we've made change. There's never been a movement in this that's country right. or in the world that was not led by young folk. That's never right. been a movement. And so once again, we find ourselves in this position. We've got to support, um, support them. Even, even, even the one that's the day Easter Monday, even the one that Jesus led was young folk. That's and what I'm saying to, is the same thing Latasha is saying. If you go to North Carolina, students at A&T are mobilized. Yep. Yes. Elizabeth City State where they tried to take over. We came here by invitation today of students. That's right. Not to, not to, 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 to move beyond students. That's right. And when we say coming together, it's not, you don't come together because there's no movement. You come together because there are movements to help connect them. That's right. That's the difference. That's right. You come together to connect them so that the students in Pennsylvania are connected with the students in North Carolina. And the students in North Carolina are connected. Right. And our job as graduates and as, are to help. That's what was the genius of the 1960s meeting. And if you see on this list, it tells you the four things that we're talking about. Nobody, this is not even a competition about who gets a headline or who doesn't. Right. Right. We facing the hellious attack That's of defunding. Attack. And when the, right. what, what attacks ought to do is bring you together. That's right. Bring you together. Because we, 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 I've got, let's, let's real quick, I've, we've got, what, tw nine in North Carolina. Yep. And right. even though we've got nine HBCUs in North Carolina, we got to battle all the time. That's right. Oh, battle. Last question. Last question. Yes, sir. Thank you so much for that question. Um, so yes, as a student government president, I, I am in a consistent network and a consistent conversation with other student leaders um, at our neighboring HBCUs and then other HBCUs across the country. And we have had discussions to this capacity as, as to what the action plan would look like. And of course, you know, things look a little bit different from state to state and from legislature to legislature. Mm -hmm. But I think the common ground altogether is that students are the leaders of these um, initiatives and it's important yes. to continue educating our bodies. That's something that we've been working on primarily at Tennessee State is to consistently educate students on what this mean for our, means for our university yes. and what these decisions actually are. So, so we do plan um, as the next generation of leaders approaches the table and you know a lot of those elections are taking place currently. We're, 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 we're passing down um, the knowledge that we've gained, we've passed down the conversations that we've had with legislatures and essentially just being that support system for the next set of student leaders that are already equipped and already prepared to face on these issues. Yeah, that's right. Thank you. That's yeah. Hey, one thing. Um, you also need to keep this keep in perspective. There are multiple generation TSU graduates. Yes. That's right. And they literally are saying the same story. Yes. So when you have grandparents, parents, and, ch and their children yes. complaining about the exact same issue, that explains to you historical underfunding. 
And so what these students are saying, they don't want their children That's right. who will say, I want to go to Tennessee State to be fighting the exact same battle that they are fighting. Last point, the Nashville movement, it was in this city. All right. Yes. HBCU presidents told those students, if y'all join the civil rights movement, we're kicking you out of the college. Mm. So that actually happened. So we also got to keep in mind what this city birthed in terms of uh, student movements. Mm. Uh, we're going to be tonight, we're broadcasting for two hours. So we're going to have a, more students are going to be there. Other folks are going to be there. We at uh, Pleasant Green Baptist Church. 1410 Jefferson Street from 5 to 7. Yeah. And the whole conversation is focused on what we talked about here. So there'll be more voices there and they'll be talking about again what they're actually moving forward. Because even though the legislature has made this move, you got to keep in mind, you also have a potential legal action because the Tennessee student, the representative on the board, is actually chosen by the university. Right. So how can the legislature get rid of a student, a student trustee mm -hmm. that they don't pick? The governor does not actually pick the student trustee. So again, understand, y'all got to be asking a different set of questions. How can the legislature remove a student trustee that they do not have the actual legal authority to appoint? That's right. So we've raised, we also want you to know that on Wednesday night, on Wednesday? Yes, Wednesday night. At Black Voters Matter, uh, with the top, say Black Voters blackvotersmatter.org, there's going to be a virtual teach-in, all right? Yes, that's virtual right. Virtual teach-in, what time? Six o'clock. At 6 o'clock, 6 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. So we want everybody that's listening on this media to hear this. Lastly, 6.30, 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m. We came here, I want you to understand, when Roland put out the call to join, to stand yes. on this hollow ground, that's right. because so much was birthed from here. Mm. And we are in a time when there will be multiple birthings. Yes. Mm -hmm. The song we sung, and y'all, you might come and close us out. The song we sung was Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn yeah, right. Me Around. Yes. And really, it's Ain't Gonna Let Nobody Turn Us Around. Yes. That's right. That's right. So wherever you can fight, we need to be fighting yes. and standing mm -hmm. and moving and acting. And then lastly, you know, they say this is April Fool's Day. But we came here today to say we ain't being fooled. We're not being fooled about what's really going on and what the underfunding really is and what the battles really are. Brother Wimberly and Darrell, you all represent, man, just power. And what I want to say is we will not create a false dichotomy that only serves to undermine mm. our fight together. Wow. It's not versus old versus young and young versus old. Mm. We is the most important That's word right. in the we, justice yeah. vocabulary. Yeah. If we stand together, yeah. we can fight back and beat anything together. Yeah. Yeah. Yara, you want to close us out in your own way? So let's do this. Let's start with, um, and this is representative of, of all the uh, HBCUs. But real quick, a, a, a little something for TSU, and this extends to the other schools as well. I'm so glad yeah. all right. I go to TSU. All right. yeah. I'm so glad. I go to TSU. Oh, yes. I'm so glad I go to TSU. Singing glory, hallelujah. I'm so glad. One more time. I'm so glad I go to TSU. I'm so glad. I'm so glad I go to an HBCU. Come on. 
I'm so glad I go to an HBCU. I'm so glad I go to an HBCU. Sing and glory, hallelujah. I'm so Let's do that one more time. I'm so glad I go to an HBCU. I'm so glad I go to an HBCU. I'm so glad I go to an HBCU. Sing it, glory, hallelujah. I'm so glad. You got my number. Get the phone.